Hello, and welcome to episode eight of the Airgun World podcast, brought to you in association with Crack Shot, the Southwest Premier Airgun Centre and Ranges. Okay, so t- joining me today is uh, my ever faithful right hand man, the godfather of air gunning himself, Terry Doe. How are you, Terry? I'm absolutely marvellous today, thank you very much. Okay, and as you will have noticed, uh, joining us on this show, we've got a special guest, and trust me, he is very special. It's Gary <laughs> Chillingworth, <laughs> aka Chilly. Now, for those of you who don't know who Gary is, um, he is our main man when it comes to HFT. Uh, competition shooting in the magazine. Gary's been writing for the mags for longer than I can remember. Um, And HFT obviously stands for Hunter Field Target. Now, Gary has been national champion twice, and I believe you've been world champion as well. So welcome to the show, Gary. Oh, that is very nice to have you. Uh, Sorry, to have you. So very nice of you. (laughs) No, very nice of you to have me. Look, I finished (laughs) the night shift last night. My brain isn't working very well. It's very nice to be here is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Okay, so it's it's by no coincidence that we've got you on this week, Gary, because I, a couple of weeks ago, headed up towards Doncaster to meet the guys at Camelot's Airgun Club to do a oh. feature on them. It's a new, new club. Um, it's only been going since September, so about six months. I've already got over 100 members. It's a brilliant setup up there. Um, fantastic clubhouse, loads of ranges, loads of enclosed booths with benches to shoot. But more importantly... They have got three HFT courses. Now, one of them's an open ground course, right? Uh, but they've got two woodland courses up there. And I was I had a walk around with uh, the owner, Danny, and his right-hand man, Dom, and the pair of them uh, shot their new woodland HFT course, and they both shot like absolute pigs, which was quite funny. I don't, I'm sure they won't mind me saying. <laughs> I think it was the pressure of me being there with a the camera. But I inadvertently signed myself up to shoot an HFT competition. It's called the Camelot's Cup. It's quite an interesting backstory between the range. Now, Gary, I've read, obviously, every article you've ever written. I've watched all your videos on, uh, well, you do do a series for us, don't you, on Shooting and Country TV on YouTube called Life at the Range. Yeah. There's one thing that I'm going to go dive straight in and ask you about that is just something that keeps going in one ear and out the other with me. And that is okay. scopes for HFT, because yeah. I know there's a whole sort of rules and regulations. And can you explain to everyone what the rules are surrounding scopes? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's no problem at all. The, the, there aren't that many rules to do with scopes in HFT. We shoot with a maximum of 12 times magnification, but most people shoot on 10. And for reason for this is the biggest rule in HFT is that once you've taken your first shot, you cannot touch your scope. You can't dial in for parallax. You can't adjust windage or or elevation. You can't you know you can't do anything with it. So HFT is shot from eight yards to forty five. So unless you've got something like a Zeiss Conquest or you know a really like a very very expensive scope, you're not going to be able to see everything in perfect clarity from eight to forty five yards. So you have to pick a median parallax. Now. My scope is set at 30 yards on the parallax. So that means for me, eight yards to around about 12 yards is quite blurry. But on the eight yard target, I have to draw my head back along the scope, sorry, back along the stock so that I can see the eight yard target. Of 45 yards, there's a little bit of blur, but, but not a lot. But what HFT shooters do is they use that blur to help you range find a target. When I lay down and I'm looking a really shoot tar- a really short target, if I can't see the kill zone without moving my head, I know it's eight yards. If I can just about make out the ring of the kill zone, I know it's ten. If I'm looking out on the on the um, a forty yarder and it's absolutely crystal clear, I know it's forty yards. If there's a slight amount of blur, I know it's forty five. So having that blur within the scope is incredibly important. But essentially. Most people use something like, it's almost like I've set this up, um, use something like this. Now, this is an Optisan CP 10 by 32. Now, there was a scope many years ago called the Hawk Night Eye Digital, if I don't know if you remember those. But that had a 50 yeah. millimeter objective. But the quality of the glass was so good, you could use it for HFT. So essentially, take your scope, get onto a range. If you can make out all the kill zones, it's good to go. 
Excellent. So I haven't got to buy myself a new scope then. I'm, I'm shooting a Hawk uh, 412 by 44. Would that, would that suit? Line. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Has it got the uh, multi aim point reticle? Yes. Right. So it's probably a half mil dot. So yeah. it, I, I used to shoot the Hawk TAC 30. Um, absolutely amazing scope. I had a 40 yard zero. So the half dot above 40, I think, was everything from 15 to about 35. Then it dropped down into the 40, which was your crosshair, and your secondary parallax, which is like your 13 yards. And 45 yards was half a dot under cross. So as long as you... Right, this is... I'm sure we're going to go up to set up later. But when you're setting up your scope for HFT, don't shoot targets, shoot paper. If you've got a 35 mil target out of 40 yards and you're aiming in the center, you could miss it 17 mil high, 17 mil low, 17 mil left, 17 mil right, and the target's still going to fall over. If we were shooting paper and we had a group like that, we'd be going, this gun's got to go back or the scope isn't on straight or something like that. So set paper out, 8, 10, 25, 30 yards out, shoot paper and then learn your aim points from there. That makes complete sense. I mean, you're you're obviously used to doing that, Terry. Yeah, that's paper never lies. You don't get any any like pinging in off the edge, um, and you know it, it's yep. it's it right on or it right or it isn't. And it's if you remember with the wind out there as a, as an absolute constant, what you're trying to yep. do is aim at the hor- at the horizon right through the middle of the kill to give you the greatest um, sort of miss error zone you you can have. If you've misranged it, or if your aim point isn't right, you're shooting at a 45 yarder. If you've misranged that at 40 yards, you're actually only shooting in the bottom third. You're trying to hit a kill the size of the bottom third. You just doubled the difficulty yeah. of that target. So this training that that Gary's talking about is absolutely vital. And near enough isn't good enough. You want to be hitting pellet marks at every single range that the targets you're going yeah. to face. And I mean, I mean pellet holes. You're going to be at ragged pellet holes at that range so that when you see a 43-yard target, you're aiming at the centre of it, not the top top segment or the bottom segment of it because the wind will catch you out. Remember, they're circular. Yeah. They're not square kills. So if they were square, yeah. it wouldn't be so bad. But they're circular, and you, you will double the difficulty of a target by misranging it by five yards. Yeah, and we've got 25 mil targets that go out to 40 yards. Now, if you can imagine a 25 mil target, if you're aiming the bottom of that, if you're out by a couple of yards, when you're talking about that curve at the bottom, that's less than a 15 mil, you know, and you're now shooting at a sub 15 mil at 40 yards in wind, and you might have elevation, so you're having to aim up or aim down, and all of these things are designed to catch you out because gone are the days where call cool setters stick out 40 or 40 millimeter targets at 40 yards everything is now to the extreme you know you mm. go down to Maldon district air gun club and each week you're shooting a, a world-class quality course and there are no little jimmy gimmies everything is there to push you to the ex- you know to the extent of what you and the gun can do that's what it's about eliminating variables yep. and the greatest variable is you and the wind. The wind will always be there. You don't have to go out the night before and get slaughtered and come there with a thick head and, and you're not functioning. That's down to you. Depends how much winning means to you. If yeah. if you can eliminate the variables on your rifle, which they if they're set up properly, they'll outshoot everybody in the world. And, the, and yeah. the pellets, you can eliminate those. You can eliminate the variables on the scope. But you'll have lighting conditions and weather and wind and you. And they're the variables you've really got to attack. And training and knowing what you're shooting at to the yard is the best way to do that. I mean, Terry's just touched on something there, you know, about it being you and not the gun. Um, I shoot obviously a, a TX two hundred, but the biggest variable, I, th- I think, is you know, I, I've said this on on the videos a lot recently and in the magazines that my shooting has taken a big dip. Um, I used to be averaging with the spring gun fifty uh, threes, fifty fours out of sixties, and that's dropped down to to mid forties. And I've been on a on a search trying to work out what has gone wrong. And it's a mixture of things. It's I became diabetic. Um, I also am not getting enough sleep because I say I'm a train driver and I work night shifts. And I started to plot 
and this is another thing you can do with HFT, I started to plot my scores. And I found out that if I was finishing a night shift on the Sunday morning, jumping in the car, grabbing the gun, going to a shoot, when I hadn't slept, my scores were terrible. If I'd eaten something, if I had a bacon sandwich or something like that, spiked the blood sugar or wasn't drinking enough water, it all affected my shooting. However, when I started being sensible and getting a night's sleep, having some porridge or something that was slow release, hydrating properly, all of a sudden my scores were back to what they should be, 52s, 53s, 54s. So it's all about not just training with the gun, it's about training yourself and listening to your body, especially when you're getting... Look, um, our current HFT world champion, uh, Alex Honeywell, he shot. He won the world championships of the WHFTO and the WHFTA. And I know for a fact that at this year's world championships, he'd been out at Disco Bulgaria the night before with Richard Woods and was dancing and drinking and, and canoodling until four or five o'clock. I don't know if it was canoodling, but it was definitely dancing and drinking until four <laughs> or five o'clock in the morning, had two hours sleep in the back of his car and then won and won the world championships. He's in his early 20s. Yeah. If yeah, I tried to do that, I would be in a puddle. <laughs> I could do it religiously once, but uh, after a while, the older you get, certainly yeah. when you hit 40, when you hit 40, that's a, you've got some time to go for that, Gary. I know you're dreading it, but um, <laughs> no, you've got to, again, it's just, how much do you want it? How much do you want it? Do you really want to go on the night out with the lads the night before, or do you want to put your all yeah. into that competition? And any level of acceptance, any level of expectation is fine, as long as you're safe, legal, and then you're enjoying yeah. it. But if you really, really want it, don't undermine yourself the night before. That's, that's what I'd no. say. Don't undermine your, your chances and then think, oh, I should have won that. So that's down to you. You're, you're 100, 100% right. I mean, the amount of people that we've had turn up and – even not, you know, it's not a case of being out like boozing or like before. They've come out and they're not prepared. You know, they'll say, mm. oh, well, um, yeah, I just shot that 25 mil at 45 yards. Uh, 25 mils can't go out to 45 yards. Do you not know the rules? And they've, they've not learned the rules. They, they haven't set up their gun properly. And they've driven hundreds of miles. They've spent a lot of money on guns and kit. And they haven't mm. even downloaded a set of the rules and gone, right, well, a 50 mil can go from 13 to 25 yards. A 20 can go out to 30. These are all little things, you know, uh, supported standards. They can only go out to 30 with a 25 mil target. Know this information because it illuminates loads of things that it can't be. And that's a, a good trick in HFT. Sometimes you can't work out what the range of the target is, but you can work out what it isn't. It isn't. And if you yeah, can eliminate yeah. everything that it isn't, then mm. you can go, right, well, it's now between this thing, so I'll put the middle of that in the aim point, then look at the history, and everything is low, you know it's probably shorter, if everything is high, it's probably longer, and you can start to, uh, you know, mm. you can go, right, I'm going to hedge my bets, and it, it will definitely yeah. help. It's, I used to call it the luck zone. The luck zone is far better if you've eliminated the need for luck as much as you can, yeah. if you, if the luck zones put you at 44 yards and the targets at 45, then you're, then you're doing pretty well. If you're relying on luck and the targets at, at 45 and you you're shooting it for 35, you can forget your luck. You ain't going to have that amount of luck. But as far as, as far as the um, getting prepared and all that, do you know, I, for individual competition, it didn't used to bother me. In fact, I, I'd quite laugh at it because I thought, well, if you've taken yourself out of the game by getting slaughtered the night before or not preparing, yeah. then that's more of a chance for me. But when I, when I did dig in and I was a real pain over it, was team shooting. Team shooting mm. was a different thing. Everybody, imagine that, every other member of the team has worked really, really hard and they trained and they were down the club with me at you know silly times when they should have been doing better things. And then one guy's not into it he's going to undermine it and you know one bad team score one bad shooter on a team score that's yeah. the end of the team then i would kick yeah. off and, and in the end i said look i'm not even going to do this if you're not all going to take it seriously otherwise we'll all have a good old laugh which i, I love to do more than anything but team shooting different game i was horrible for team shooting <laughs> I, back in i think it was 2012 2013 um i, I shot for team england with a with a pcp uh, the uh, the world championships and I'll tell you what, the pressure, because it's a six-man team and, you know, it's done by the top, yeah. uh, from the previous year, the top six shooters in the Nationals. And 
the pressure that it's bad enough letting yourself down, but letting down the people around you, that's really what you don't want to do. And you can't. I, yeah, I found that one of the most high pressure things. Uh, I don't know if I enjoyed it. I love the winning. Uh, we won the world yeah. team title and, and, and uh, some districts and stuff. But when, without being, without being big headed, when you are expected, like you would have been, to put in a good score, they're banking on yeah. you, mate. They're banking yeah. on you. And, and like we beat ourselves up enough as it is if we miss something we should have yeah. hit. But if you're doing it on behalf of five other people and your region yeah. or your country, oh man, I don't even know if I, I used to, that, that was more pressure on me than absolutely anything. But when you won, Oh, that was that was pretty intense too, wasn't it? Yeah. Come on, we're we're going to be scaring people off with all this, <laughs> HFT, because from from my, it's my very limited experience, HFT like bench rest shooting is all abilities, all ages, hundred percent, boys, girls, kids, OAPs. Yeah. It's really accessible, and yeah. it is from what I know of it at, at club level which is what everyone, if they want to have a go at HFT, that's what they're going to be doing. It's a, just a really good day out and a good laugh. And there's loads of yeah. Mickey taking and bacon sandwiches. And, you know, it's, there's none of this pressure that you guys have just been rattling on about um, at no. top level. You know, it's, it is very accessible. But so let's, let's to keep that in mind for people watching, listening to this, that have never shot yeah. HFT, like myself. Yeah. Um, can you run us through... A basic uh, course. What, what are the rules? I know you've got targets from eight to forty-five. They're yeah. they're ground level. They're chest level. They're up in the trees. Yeah. Um, how, how how many targets do you have? How, how does it score? What's what's the game? Right. Well, let's say you're one hundred percent right. Um, I mean, me and Terry have been talking about the world championships and that. And even if you go to the world championships, you've got people there who are relatively new to the sport. Um, the whole point of HFT is it is fully inclusive. So whether it be a national, a local, a world, or something like that, no matter what your level, if you are safe and you're happy to be there, we're happy to have you. Now, I'll give you, for instance, at the last uh, two weeks ago, I shot at the amazing Wendover Air Gun Club. Um, it was round six of the Southern Hunters. And within that Southern Hunters, we had youngsters like Ollie Usher and Oscar Usher. They were, I think they're eight and ten. And we had Jean Greatrix, who was in her 70s, shooting off sticks. Now, within an HFT course, you've got different classes. You've got open class, which is all of your PCPs. Um, gas rams are in the open class. And semi recoilless rifles like the amazing Diana 54. You've got your, uh, your Dan Buster class, your 2-2 class. You've got your recoiling class. You've got veterans. You've got ladies. And you've got juniors. And you've usually got a team event as well. 30 targets, 24 will be laying down prone, six will be what they call positionals. Two of those will be unsupported. One will be an unsupported stander, which is a 35 millimeter out to 35 yards, and one will be an unsupported kneeler, and that will be again with 35 millimeter out to 35 yards. You've then got four positionals, which are two stand only, which is supported. So you'll have a tree or a fence post or a hay bale, which you've got to stand to shoot. And then you've got two which are kneel or stands, and they can go out to 40 yards. And you've got a choice. You can shoot them kneeling or standing, but again, they're both 35 millimeter targets. Um, card target sizes are ranging from 15 millimeters from 13 to 25 yards, 20 millimeters from 8 to 30, 25 from 8 to 40. And then usually uh, for 30 millimeters, 8 to 40, the same as 25s. And then your 35 mil will go out to uh, 45. Sometimes you'll get a 40 mil thrown in the mix, but you don't really see them very often. You just mentioned shooting off sticks. Now, when I was yes. up at Camelops, Danny and Dom went round for a, for a round of shooting. They said, bring your gun, you can have a go. And it was like, no, I've got my camera. <laughs> I want to take some pictures of you guys for the feature in the mag. Um, but they were shooting off sticks, and they said they, they, they alternate between shooting HFT off sticks and what you've just explained. So yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that, that, that the sticks option is a, a, a league of its own, and that's designed for 
people like us, really, oldies, <laughs> who can't get down on the ground and kneel very often. And, you know, if I'm laying on the yeah. ground for 24 prone shots, it's going to take me half an hour to get back up again because of my back. Right. The, 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 stick, the stick thing has become massive in the last couple of years. Um, the vast majority of us shoot HFT prone, and sticks was brought in. Initially, it was developed uh, a, a gun club called Iden Ferns, and there were a few other. I mean, Gillies uh, hunters have been using the, the the quad sticks for years, but it started in Iden Ferns, and there was I think there was a couple of people up north doing it. But then these Iden Ferns guys came to Moulmond District, and we developed this thing called Para HFT. Now people thought it stood for like a paraplegic or para, you know, or something like that, you know, or para as in military. No, it was parallel. It is a a completely separate type of shooting that shot parallel alongside HFT. Now you'll have a, a usually a tripod, and I've got one here. Now this is a prototype of a clamp that sits on top of your sticks. This one's developed by Bob Pattenden, and it's adjustable. Now, you can't actually clamp your rifle, but what this is, is if you've got a rifle with a narrow end, you can sit that in the V, or if you've got one with a bottle, see, I'm already prepared, you've got a bottle that can sit in there. And it sits on there, and you can... <laughs> And most rifles, I've got my, this is my stick gun. Now let me just grab it without dropping it. Tony Vilas would not be happy. This is my stick rifle. And as you can see, it's got a stop on the front. So here's your thing on top of your sticks. That sits on, pushes up against it. And then with it pushed up against it, and you're pushing into the stick and pulling back on the stick, you can get an amazing amount of, uh, of accuracy. People are shooting 58s and 59s out of 60 with sticks. But what it's about is people like my friend Green, Jean Greatrix. Now, Jean won't mind me saying that she's in her 70s. And she was thinking about giving up HFT because getting down and rolling in mud and all of that, you just don't want it. But she can now turn up with her sticks, put it there, shoot the target, and she can carry on. And this is what stick shooting has done. It has given so many people the ability to continue shooting. It's, it's the best. Mm -hmm. It is the best thing that's happened to HFT in years. Right, I'm going to give a shameless plug to the magazine now. Uh, this one's uh, still on sale. Uh, it's the, the April issue. If you want to subscribe, there'll be a link down below in the description. Or you can head on over to airgunshooting.co.uk and check out. We've got loads of different... Uh, subscription offers on there. You can also sign up to our newsletter uh, at uh, airgunshooting.co.uk as well. Um, now, here we go. This is your latest feature. What to do in 2024? You've just mentioned the various classes, uh, yes. et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people listening, watching to this will probably be thinking, oh, it's all about PCPs and stuff, but it's, it's not. You've just mentioned that you shoot an air arms, uh, was it TF200? Um, so there is a Springer class, and you've won competitions with that rifle, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> this is um, – actually, Dave, while I remember, uh, somebody actually mentioned to me the other day <laughs> – I know this is the wrong place to ask um, – do you still get the free insurance with the magazine? Yes, you do. You still get better insurance when you subscribe, so – no, I had an email earlier on from a guy saying, Gary, I want to get a subscription. Do I still get the free insurance? I thought, I don't yes, know, but do. I know a man who will. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is my TX200. I, I would say there are many like it, but this one is mine. But no, there aren't many like this. Um, many years ago, when I was working with your predecessor, Matt Clark, at the uh, at Air Gunner magazine, so we had an email from a reader that said, Gary, I, I want an aftermarket stock, but I can't afford the five or six hundred pounds that it costs. So I sat down and went, can we build an aftermarket stock for under 50 quid? And I thought, let's have a go. So I got, I pulled this scrap TX stock off of eBay. We put a 3D printed, printed butt pad on it from Brian Sampson. I think that was 30 pounds. Um, we put a hamster on it. This is a bit of two by one that I got out of the shed with a couple of bolts going up into it. And these collars, they were made from a cut down, um, 
uh, from a cut down umbrella that I found on the train because it had a carbon tube. <laughs> um, I've got some wheel weights on the front. I'm not taking out flip, but I'm adding inertia to the front of the gun so that it's harder for it to move. There's, uh, I think it's 160 grams like that. Um, and here we've got a cheek piece, which is a piece of Kydex, which is a formable plastic. You stick it in the oven, you heat it up, then you, it was bent over the top of a vitamin C bottle to give the curve. That cost me, I think it was £55, and that has won me two national and a world title um, wow. using that stock. I paid 600 quid for an amazing LP um, green thing. Never got on with it. Went back to shooting the Frankenstock, and it's uh, it fits me because it's designed to fit me. And this is the thing: mm. gun fit is more important than virtually anything else. If you've got a gun that's too big for you, too small for you, it's you're putting your cheek on the piece. Oh, sorry, you're putting your cheek on the cheek riser, and your eye is pointing at the bottom of the scope, and you're having to like get your head up. You're never going to get the level of accuracy that you need. So gun fit, build a gun around you. That's why I've said every gun should come with an adjustable cheek piece because it's the most, you know, it's incredibly important. I mean, Terry, you're an FT shooter. You've got some of the most funky guns we've ever seen in, in mm. the sport. Mm. I mean, Warren Edwards, some of the stuff he makes is amazing. What did you shoot when you were a young slip of a lad? A young slip of a lad. I started, believe it or not, with a standard um, HW77K. And the three people on this screen now, for the delight of the, the viewers and listeners, are po possibly the least standard human beings you could possibly produce. <laughs> so I around and I did okay. And I thought, well, this doesn't fit me. So I went to Air Masters, ordered um, a 77 FTS. John Wellham measured me up. He stuck, a, I think, a three-inch extension on the standard stock, but he did it in rosewood and mahogany inserts. But, and, and he created Emily, the most beautiful rifle that mm. there has ever been officially voted in by me. But then I went back to him when I went, um, I went PCP, and every single rifle I've ever shot well with has, has been made to fit me. That's why I, 10 years ago I went on a crusade about this because the technical development of the rifles had exceeded our abilities anyway, Yet we weren't mm. even fitting. Imagine, imagine the beloved Nike um, making the best trainers in the world, but only in size nine. Only size yeah. nine. <laughs> best to use our wedge them or pack them out or whatever. It was ridiculous. And I will tell you now, and, and the, the priceless queen of all of our sport, Claire at Air Arms, will confirm my nagging led to the, the, the rifle that we all know and love, the ultimate sporter. Because I yeah. said hunters, hunters actually should have rifles that fit them, even more than target shooters should, because the result of inaccuracy in hunting is wounding and it's yeah. unacceptable. So yeah. that's where that all came from. And I totally agree with you. Gun fit is the most important thing. The, the mechanical performance of the rifles has left us ages ago, back in the first yeah. day state days. But we've got to... You know, I, I, I would recommend everybody to do my little test of safely pick up your unloaded and uncocked rifle, close your eyes, put it to your, to your shoulder or the position you, you shoot most, keep your eyes closed. And if when you open those eyes, you have to modify your position to look down the center of the scope, you need to make some mm. changes. Changes need to be made because you're compromising there and there's no room for that. A really good trick as well, if you're going to do that. Sometimes if you've got a, uh, I've got a, um, uh, a, a Vortex Viper Gen 2, and it's got a, a four, um, the, it's got a very, very large ocular, uh, ocular lens. Mm. And you can put it up to your eye, and you could be looking through the bottom of the lens at the, uh, the ocular end, you know, the, the end by your eye. Um, so you don't know if you're looking through the dead center. So this was talked to me. Oh, I can't remember who it was who talked to me. I've got, yeah. Um, basically, wrap the the end of your ocular end in tin foil, mm. create a small hole in the slap bang in the center, and then put the scope up to your eye. And if you can't mm. see through, if you're still looking at tin foil, your mm. cheek piece needs to be adjusted. So yeah. be aware that you might not be looking through the dead center. 
Mm. We used to do the same with Butler Creek lens caps. Um, if, yeah. you, if you had a, a 10 mil hole, 12 mil hole in the end, uh, that would sharpen up. That not only would it train you to get your eyes right in the middle, but it would sharpen up the close yeah. targets as well. So um, yeah. I know you can't do it in HFT, but as a training medium, it's perfect. Yes. And it's so important. Remember, the position of your head will dictate the, the, your neck muscles, your shoulder muscles. And it's a big old, look yeah. at these three heads in front of us. Big old lump, your head, isn't it? And, and if, it's, <laughs> if that's hanging out there to dry, the rest of your body and your stance has to, has to compensate for that dirty great yeah. weight hanging out there. So get it right. Get it absolutely right. And take I, all, the, even with adjustable guns, even with adjustable cheek pieces and butt pads, if, you're, if you've got that right, in under an hour, you've got it wrong. And when you go back to it again, you'll probably have to adjust it again. But keep doing it until it's yeah. dead right. Because we change. We actually change. Yeah. None of us are the, uh, the athletes we used to be. You know. <laughs> the, the thing is, as I'll just touch on another thing, and this is something that we get all the time in HFT. People will rock up uh, again at Morning District and they'll sit on the benches, lovely and comfortable, and they'll shoot their targets, you know, 35, 40 yards, and they'll set their gun up. And then when they lay down and prone, because when you're sitting on a bench and you're like that, that's great. But when you're laying down, your head is mm. in a completely different position. And then all of a sudden they're missing high. If you're going to shoot prone, train prone, set up prone. Don't expect mm. to shoot from a bench and then everything be the same when you're laying down because it's going to be a completely different aim point. And, yeah, and what perfect. Terry said there is, is very true. If you turn up at a shoot and you're dehydrated or you're a bit puffy or something like that, you can actually don't use that fleshy bit as your as your uh, as your reference point on your thing. Use that bone because that bone mm. will never move. That's part of your skull. So when you're mm. setting up, you push down with that bone onto your cheek cone and look through there. Don't use that fleshy bit because that changes depending on how much hydration you've had. There's, there's one l last little thing I'd like to add to all that. Train Ooh. in the clothes you shoot in, you compete in. Yep. Don't train in a T-shirt. Even, even if it's red hot out there, if you're going to shoot in a jacket, train in that jacket. Get things set up to you wearing that jacket, not, not wearing a T-shirt, everything. Yeah, you can, you can swap sh leggings for shorts if you really need to cool down, yep. or you take the jacket off between lanes. I, I remember being out in... Um, out in California, hundred and oh, it was ridiculous. Literally frying eggs on the on the things. But I kept the jacket on. I kept the jacket yeah. on. There was there was a cup of soup in each armpit by the time I finished. I've got to say, not a pleasant thing. I'm surprised their customs didn't impound it on the way home. But again, it's inconsistency. You you keep consistent, and what you wear should be should be what you wear in competition should be what you wear in training. Every bit of it: gloves, jacket. Boots, same boots, training what you shoot in. So it's all familiar. Then you can tell yourself when you're lining up on that 30 yard or 40 yard or whatever, you can then switch to your, to your training. Oh, I've done this a million times on the range. Mm. And you've got your dress the same. You've got the same rifle, same pellets, everything. I've done this a million times. Confidence goes up, knock it over. It's all about consistency. Mm. Terry, you've okay. just mentioned gloves. Yeah. Um, that's something that obviously we I say a lot in the photographs that Gary sends in for for his reports and his his tuition. Um, the whole glove thing. What 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 does that do, Gary? What's um, the purpose yeah. of it? Um, actually, before I go any further, first thing I say is yes, each each month I send in my articles. Um, what a lot of people don't know is I write my illiterate ramblings, put them down in things, send them off, and then Dave passes them on to his mum, Rosie, who fixes <laughs> all the grammar and all my spelling and everything like that. So I want to go officially on record and say thank you very much to Dave's mum for turning my illiterate rubbish into something that's reasonable. So, um, yeah, I don't actually have my HFT glove with me, but uh, I have a glove, which is a, a lovely little pink glove, um, you don't need to go out and spend uh, 30, 40 pounds on something like an Anschutz 110 or an Anschutz 109 shooting glove. Something like this, which is like a little neoprene glove, nice one in pink, um, will actually work, not as well, but it will certainly work. And I think these were a fiver off eBay. Now, the whole point of the glove is, unlike field target, which sits in a gate, we use a thing called a peg. And you approach the you approach the peg, and a part of you has got to touch the peg. Most people will grip the peg, 
and they will rest their gun on top of their hand. So you're going to have grip there to grip the peg. You're going to have grip there to rest the gun on. And the, the glove is thick. And sometimes you'll get a pulse in your hands. And you'll actually see the crosshair moving up and down. That glove will actually remove that pulse. If you're shooting one of the supported targets, like we were talking about earlier on, and you're resting your hand up against a tree and it's been raining, that tree will be incredibly slippery. And if you're not wearing a glove, your hand's going to be slipping around, getting covered in sap, and now you're resting a gun, a wooden gun on a wet hand on a wet tree, you're not going to get a lot of grip. So you put your hand up against the tree, stick it on top, and you shoot. Now, one thing you've got to be careful with with gloves is people have a tendency not to clean them. We had a shooter at Malden, a guy called Lloyd, lovely guy, had a cut in his hand put his glove on that had not been cleaned since 1973 and got and got uh, sepsis, got blood poisoning. Was very, very ill um, because the bacteria that builds up, because your hand's sweating in your glove and it builds up and it got into the skin and it got into the blood and he was very, very ill. Um, so every now and then take your glove off, stick it in the washing machine or just fill it with fairy liquid and give it a clean. Excellent stuff. Okay, so I think we've pretty much covered just about everything that I wanted to talk to you about. Is there anything else you want to mention about uh, HFT and getting into it? Um, I, I think the most important thing is if you've got an HFT club or an, or an FT club, you know, I, I know I give the FT guys a bit of banter every now and then, but... The most important thing is it's not what you shoot, it's that you shoot. Um, if you're going to be a hunter, if you're watching this podcast, you think, I'm going to get myself an air rifle and go hunting, the first thing you need to do is go and shoot some HFT because the amount of times that we have people rock up, say, yeah, I'm a hunter, and they go and shoot a 15-millimeter target at 25 yards and they miss it by half a mile. HFT, you can practice all your skills for hunting before you go out and shoot an animal. And targets don't lie. This is the thing. If you've gone and you've shot an HFT course with your top-of-the-line gun and you've come in with a 30 out of 60, you should not be hunting. And use it as a resource and a skill, you know, to, to, to improve your hunting. But, yeah, FT, HFT, bench rest, whatever you want to do, just get out there and, and, and shoot with people and just find like-minded people and, and go and have a bit of fun, you know, and you're yeah. always welcome, you know, at, at any club. Get to, to, to a club, explore what you can do, learn your trade, learn your trade before yeah. you go out and hunt. Not only is it a brilliant resource anyway, and you will be a better hunter, I promise you you'll be a better hunter, because as as I, I will tell you this for a fact, if Dave or me or Chili were lining up on a 30-yard rabbit in your head, You've, range, you've done the range finding, you're looking at the wind, you're looking at the surroundings, and you're, you're applying windage, and it's all in a second, it's all in a fraction, and it's all learned. It's not instinctive. Yeah. You don't, honestly, nobody's born with this. It's a ridiculous mm. ability to be able to project something from a, a yard and a half of machinery to, to, a, to a rabbit's brain 30-odd yards away. We learned it. Yeah. And some of us learned, took far too long, me, trial and error, and when I went to uh, my first air gun club, I learned more in three months than I had in 20 years. I promise you. Yeah. So go there. Don't take it as some sort of you're not good enough challenge. Go and learn. Learn about your gear. Learn about yourself. It's one. And you'll yeah. have a great time doing it. I promise you. One of the most important things in HFT is be comfortable. Um, Terry was saying earlier on about training the clothes that you're going to shoot in, which is true. If you turn up, I mean, HRT shoots all year round, being summer and winter, and I've got summer kit and I've got winter kit. And I change, uh, you know, I re-zero when I change from kit to kit. But if you're going to turn up at a shoot and it's going to be raining and cold and stuff like that, you need to have proper waterproof kit. Because by the end of the day, if you're halfway around the course and you're wet and you're cold, you're just going to have a miserable time and you're all you're going to want to be doing is taking that shot and getting off course. If you turn up and you're wearing proper clothing and you're warm, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story in a second about, about some of the kit I've got. Um, it's really important. And if you're going to take youngsters, make sure they've got plenty of snacks, 
plenty of hydration, and they're warm and they're dry. Otherwise, you will have a horrible day, and so will they. I mean, what sort of kit do you use for fishing, Dave? Um, what waterproof gear? Yeah, I've, I've <laughs> you know, I've been fishing a very, very long time. I've been through pretty much everything that's manufactured for fishing. And I don't think I've ever found anything that is actually 100% waterproof. So I, quite a number of years ago now, I looked at the off, offshore sailing market. You know, these guys that are on yachts out in the yeah. open going round and round the world. And I just went for Heli Hansen. Heli Hansen waterproof gear is actually completely waterproof. It's designed yeah. to be. It has to be. You know, it's sometimes you have to look outside your own sport so find something that you can bring into your sport that's going to do the job for you. It's a compromise a bit because you, you, you're active. You've got to remain flexible. You can't overheat. For me, being yep. you know, we, we've all got a bit of natural insulation, but I've never felt the cold. I don't feel the cold. I don't. I never have, even right. when I was a skinny kid. If I'm cold, most people are dead. So my problem is overheating. Modern fabrics for me are fantastic because of the, the amount of vents on the design in the zips and the pit zips and, yep. and stuff and the fact that they're breathable. So for me, I'd rather be a bit, shall we say a bit moist under the circumstances than yep. boil in the back. When it comes to hunting, I'm like pretty much everyone else. Um, you know, I've got the Jack Pike gear. Um, yeah, I've got a, 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 decent, a decent set of Sealand uh, oh, nice. waterproof gear, which is, you know, it's not completely waterproof. It's designed not to be completely waterproof. It's, it's such a fabric that, you know, you can see the, the water evaporating off you. You can see the steam evaporating off you. It's that, it's that sort of stuff. So, yeah, as, as far as shooting goes, you're never out there for that long when it's chucking it down with rain. You find a bit yeah. of cover under a tree or you give it an hour, hour and a half and think, well, sod this, I've had enough. <laughs> you know? But if you're out on a boat fishing, hence your you question yeah. before, you're out there for 12 hours in the elements yeah. and, you know, you needed some, some proper gear. So I, I don't know what you guys wear as boots, but... Back again from the fishing days, it's I found a company called Tactical 5.11 over in the States, did a bit of research, and they make all the military boots and the police yeah. boots and the fireman's boots and special forces boots for pretty much every country in the world. You know, all the, all the services and, and, and forces, they make all their boots. So I ordered a pair of, of tack lights, and they are extremely light, some winter boots, and I've had them. 14 years and they're still going wow. strong and i wear them for fishing all the time and i wear them shooting all the time but you know yeah. there's loads of other great boots out there designed for the shooting market but again yeah. i looked outside the discipline i just happened to come across a, a company that manufactures stuff for the, the world's elite forces so yeah i mean uh, the the kit i wear but with boots i've got my winter boots are hot killer um, I'm never sure how to pronounce that. I think it's hard killer um, because they've got a sole that's designed to actually drop mud. And when you're leaning against a tree and you want that grip, perfect. I've got Salomons, which I use uh, during the summer. But the most comfortable boots I've ever worn are the Jack Pike Countryman's. Um, mm. Amazing boots, really, really comfy. I've got, I've got to get some more. Um, but, yeah, the quick story, uh, the, the jacket I wear is uh, of, from a firm called Sweat Team. Um, a Swedish firm, and back in the day, Matt Clark, who was the editor in chief at Air Gun, uh, sorry, Air Gunner magazine, I managed to get him to to source me some of these Sweat Team jackets. Got sent through, and and these are expensive jackets. They're like four hundred pounds. I went, ah, blaze orange, <laughs> absolutely amazing. So I said to him, look, we've really got to do something nice with this. And Terry will probably remember this. I said, I'm going to test it in Iceland. And he goes, oh, we can't cover the cost in that. I said, don't worry, I, I'm, I'm sorting it all out. So he's gone off and Matt's told, I think he told Terry and I think he told the board, oh, we've got Gary, he's, he's testing it in Iceland. And I sent him through the photographs and there's me sitting in the freezer in Colchester in the Iceland with my <laughs> arm on some gattos reading a copy of Air Gunner. And if you ever want to see the picture, if you go to my Facebook page and Life at a Range, Brilliant. the picture's there. But it's like me leaning against it. And he went, you told me you are going to Iceland. I said, I did go to Iceland and I picked Pizza. up some pizzas while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but my mate Alex uh, Larkin, he, had a th he, remember, he was a member of a thing called USAR, which is Urban Search and Rescue for the Fire Brigade. And he had this big thermal camera 
and he measured my body temperature and then we sat in the freezer with the jacket on and measured it again and and it's amazing it's amazing how warm i stayed and yeah. it's, i'll tell you what these thermal cameras they're absolutely superb i've got to stop you there gary because i've actually ah. got one here i didn't know you, i didn't know you were going to talk about thermal stuff but uh <laughs> in, in the april issue but yeah, i've done a three-page review of this um ah. it's from pete dodsworth uh, at night vision uk he, he he sent this to me it's actually that good i've actually just bought it off him <laughs> I've got really? in my pocket. Did, did you there buy it, is. it dave <laughs> no, i did buy it i paid full price for it wow there it is that is it okay it's an x infrared it's called uh, which i believe is an offshoot of or part of the infrared company and that's it plugs into your phone like that runs off an app um and it's just an amazing bit of kit it comes with comes with all this stuff as well for the money it's all included yeah. in the price you've got a handheld like trigger grip there this unit here just screws onto the top of that i've taken it off because i've actually got this mounted on the tripod at the moment so yeah your little camera oh, goes in there like that it's all aluminium even the screws are aluminium and there's nice little rubber plates there so that screws in there like that and then you just put your phone on that bit there and you're actually using your phone as a thermal imaging camera and the guys in the states while i was researching this uh, for the review the guys that, that out in the states are using these things for shooting wild boar and, and deer and various other animals over there out to sort of 500 meters that's how good it is and wow. everything's controlled off your, off your screen off an app um you've got all your as you would have in a, a normal monocular You've got all your settings, your red hot, your white hot, that purple and pink crazy psychedelic screen you can choose, plus there's loads of other functions. It's high definition, so you set your, your, the app to HD, and you can take photos and record video through your iPhone or Android. They do an Android one as well in, in high definition, and the video is as good as it would be if you were just videoing your mates on your iPhone. Wow. Um, you know... It's phenomenal. And the, the whole lot, the whole kit, the bracket, this, you've got connecting lead, the whole shebang comes in a, in a bigger case and it's 365 quid. You know, you, if you look at a, a relatively decent monocular, you're looking at a grand. So yeah. for anyone who's watching this, give it a go. Just if you want, if you're desperate for a thermal imager spotter, and Terry will agree, it's completely revolutionised. The way, the way that we hunt absolutely changed the way we hunt um yeah grab one of them off, off pete at night vision while i'm on the subject i shoot i use a thermal spotter like most people do but on my hunting rifle which i've got here i've got just a, a normal this is a hick micro cheetah but it's just a, a, a night vision um with an infrared torch on there it's got a range finder as well but i thought i'd give a shameless plug to eagle vision cam because obviously this is a bsa r10 se super carbine now bsa use 13 millimeter dovetail rails most of the, the scope rings you get are like the 9 to 11 mil dovetails i searched and searched and searched i was looking in china i was looking all over the place for a 13 mil to pick a tinny converter and then up popped eagle vision cam they're the only company that i've found that do these so anyone that's got a bsa of any description that wants to convert their dovetail to a picatinny so they can mount a thermal or a, a infrared night vision unit this is 100 mil this this picatinny rail and i don't know if you can see that if i can get it closer to the camera up against my face that's how high it is it's about four millimeters thick uh the ones that i had that were nine to eleven mil converters were like coming up here somewhere so i've dropped myself a good eight or nine mil which has brought my scope lower to the barrel which as we all know is a, a good thing mm -hmm. so yeah if you if you own a bsa and you want to convert a rail get to eagle vision cam and, and have a look at what they've got and again i paid for that i didn't send it to me i just bought it because i really <laughs> needed it <laughs> okay, Dave, Dave, I know I'm, I'm being thick. What is the difference and what are the advantages between thermal and night vision? Okay, so 
thermal really comes into its own at longer ranges for people that are shooting like foxes or deer or wild boar anything like that thermal at that sort of range 100 yards plus um you get good definition the problem we find as air gunners when you're in a barn shooting rats at 15 20 yards or even in a field shooting rabbits to some extent you just got an orange blob the definition really isn't there as it should be when you're looking through a scope for instance if you're shooting rats on a on a muck heap it's very very hard to tell which way they're facing with a thermal orange blob right. through the scope you know they could be facing up down bum towards you head towards you that's why terry and i prefer to shoot um infrared night vision because you can see the animal you can see absolutely everything you can see its eyes i found that if i tune the, the color palette and the focus and stuff the brain of any animal glows hottest and that i've, mm. I've trained myself now even on the rats and the close range rats i've been using thermal extensively lately now i can see which way they're facing the the one that cuts across everything is the spotter the spotter is for it get a spotter get a spotter and then go i find yes there is greater definition with night vision definitely um you can see hairs and nostrils and stuff but the uh, locking onto the target there's nothing like a thermal that shouts out hey, here i am it's got a, an yeah. orange bulb inside it you know um <laughs> whereas with the with the um night vision you're you're kind of relying often on the shine back from the eye that the that the infrared's looking up it's very much yeah. uh, you choose your own deal i'm tuning myself right into thermal now really am and i'm i'm becoming worryingly addicted to it i've got to say um, <laughs> i'm wandering I'm wandering the fields at night far more than i should be uh really am I, uh... terry's just touched on a point thermal as a spotter is absolutely fantastic now this bracket like i said that this has revolutionized the way i shoot rats with my mate simon who's my shoot partner we've got some various poems up here for rats and rabbits now now we sit in a barn or out in, in, a, in, a, in a junkyard that we've got to shoot that's got loads of rats on it we sit on chairs we've got our sticks in front of us with our rifles we've got this uh thermal unit on a camera tripod in between us we're sitting next to each other this is in between us it's got pan and tilt on the tripod and we draw an imaginary line down the perm i shoot mm. left he shoots right and this thing sat in, in between us, uh, sort of chest level. We've got the whole field of view in front of us. And all of a sudden, you'll see this bright red dot pop up, you know, which is a rat or a rabbit. Mm. And it's like, oh, that's my side. I'm gonna, I'll shoot that one. You know instantly where it is. Long before my eye, especially with rabbits, I've, I've found over the years, long before they actually break cover. The, the thermal's great for shooting through grass you'll see a tiny bit of red or even like as terry's just said white sometimes you get the white glow before you get the red come out and, and you yeah. know there's a there's a, an animal there trying to break through break through the cover La night before last i was out shooting rabbits with my mate simon on a, on a new permission and i've had a scan round with this i've turned around and i was like what what the hell was that first i thought it was a cat then I thought it might be a, a small fox. And like Terry said, I, 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 zoomed, I, I, I zoomed in slightly and, and adjusted the focus. It was an otter running <laughs> through a rabbit field. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's a bit strange. But yeah, but it's the, the, the stuff you see with the thermal and the night vision when you're out at night. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, so everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, as as always, thank you to Terry and thank you to Chile for, for joining us. Um, and also thanks once again to our show sponsor, Crackshot. If you want to find out what they're all about, and they, they do some a, a really good service offering bespoke gun kits and that sort of stuff, head on over to www.crackshot.uk. I'll put a link in here. And again, head on over to our website or click the link below, subscribe to the mag, and sign up for our newsletter, please. And we shall see you all again in a month's time. Uh, I believe Matt and Richard, uh, in two weeks, they're talking to John Hatton from BSA. So that'll be a good one. Make sure you tune in for that. That's about it from us. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. Mm -hmm.